Could technology help humans to become more healthy, more themselves, and have more leisure time? Or will technology divide us, perhaps make us more stressed out, and bring us into our own zones of post-truth reality? Or perhaps not even in reality at all, but in some type of psychotic nightmare? Today, we will discuss all of this and more as we discuss transformative technology and its role in our mental health. Today's guest is Nicole Bradford. She is fascinated by the human potential and technology. She is the CEO and founder of The Willow Group and co-founder of the Transformative Technology Lab, the conference, and the Transformative Technology 200 list. Prior to becoming a leader in transformative technology, Nicole Bradford was a senior executive in video games with responsibility for strategy, operations, and marketing for major brands that include Activision, Blizzard, Disney, and Vivendi Games, including operating World of Warcraft China. Nicole Bradford is a graduate of Singularity University GSP-15, has an MBA from Wharton School of Business and Strategy, and a business BBA in marketing from the University of Houston, Texas. She is a fellow of the British American Project, served on the board of the Brandon Marshall Foundation for Mental Health, and is a former term member of the Council on Foreign Relations. She speaks regularly on transformation, exponential technology, and the culture at conferences like Singularity University's Global Summit, Exponential Medicine, Catapult Future Festival, Wisdom 2.0, and more. I'm sure you're going to enjoy Nicole on today's episode of The Intentional Clinician. If you are just listening for the first time, please hit that subscribe button so we can stay in touch. And if you are somebody who has been listening for a long while, please share this show with somebody you know that you think would find it interesting. And one last thing before we get to the interview. I wanted to let you all know that I have launched an online course for the parents of young adults. It has six video modules and PDF worksheets, and it's available on Udemy.com. At the end of this podcast, I'll be playing a preview of some of the introductory audio. If you're already interested, the link will be in the show notes. Welcome, Nicole Bradford, to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I'm so glad that we had some time today to catch up. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So I know you've been involved in technology, in transformative technology, for quite a while. And uh, as we know, have organized quite a bit of um, activity around that, including conferences and other groups. Um now, there's a lot out there people can go watch already. I've already seen some of your conference was online and some other talks that you gave. But as a podcast that covers counseling and psychology and philosophy, I'm interested to know about uh, your vision for technology and how different parts of technology can uh, help humanity with health insights and mental health and things like that. And maybe, maybe some examples as well. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. You know, um, and, and by the way, one of the things that I love about the, the, you know, intention of your podcast, you know, you know, psychology, philosophy, um, all of those things, you know, it, the greater question of, uh, for humanity of, of who are we? How does one, you know, learn how to be, feel, and become? How does one come, you know, come home to oneself in and to know oneself in such a way that then that person can truly contribute to the bigger questions, the bigger philosophical questions that humanity is really wrestling with right now, which is, you know, who are we? you know, what does the next century mean for us? What are we creating? Are we going to have an abundant society? Are we going to con- continue the inequities, you know, that have, that we've historically faced and where we're on the precipice of so much abundance. Um, and, and, you know, for us, I believe that the the human mind and, and we use the word well-being just because it's a large stadium that people can understand but within that is 
mental and emotional health, social and emotional wellness, and human purpose and performance. And these are all, you know, the psychological inner landscape, which, you know, on one end, someone might have a challenge that they're overcoming. Um, you know, the the numbers, you know, being a, a you know, in a clinic and a clinician, um, you know, you're well aware of like what happened to the, the American mind um, over the last year. Um, so there's, you know, there's those challenges. Um, but then also, you know, what I think is really inspiring is that, you know, the same mind that is, you know, is challenged and many of the same tools that, you know, can support someone in those challenges. It's also, uh, you know, on the same continuum as, um, you know, one's fullest potential. It's all, you know, playing in the same, you know, landscape. And so, you know, the role of technology is this. Today, you know, our, our really big problem is that our tech is on exponential curves and our crises are too, climate, inequality, um, you know, divisiveness. Um, but the way that people really learn how to be, feel, and become is linear and analog. And, you know, there, there aren't enough people like yourself um, to, you know, if you look at even pre-COVID, um, the numbers that the World Health Organization put out um, about, you know, depression being the leading disability worldwide, you know, just really the stress, anxiety, depression, lack of engagement, all of these things that were, you know, fully present before COVID. And already, you know, I remember, you know, looking at one stat where, you know, they estimated that in order just to meet the demand um, of today and, and 2030, if you filled every school that certifies and trains, you know, people who support the human mind in all of its very various ways, you know, with, with um, you know, uh, official uh, credentials, it would take over a hundred years to train enough people you know, to do, to just meet the demand that we're going to be facing in nine years. And this was pre-COVID uh, and, you know, and we know that's pulled it forward. And so the role of technology really is to give, you know, people like you, uh, people like the people in your facility, um, you know, superhuman, uh, you know, abilities to extend um, your reach um, and, you know, and, and to do that in a way that, you know, that, that, uh, you know, gives you the, you know, the superpowers, um, you know, to serve in the way that you're called to serve. Um, and, you know, and your help is really needed to make sure that those, you know, that those applications um, don't compromise care and don't compromise that connection. But, you know, developing technology is an iterative process. Um, and so I love, you know, speaking to people like yourself, who have audiences like you do um, to invite them to engage with engage with technology people to you know to help develop the good stuff um, that actually truly meets yours and your clients' needs. Well, that is quite a summary, and I'm I uh, definitely align with all of that. Just to kind of recap a little bit for our listeners and maybe find some uh, direction here, but I love I love the overview of this and uh, the macro meets the micro. So it, our, our philosophies are very much aligned with the fact that having awareness tools and awareness of the self and practices or technology practices or things to help us can then help us suffer less in our maybe personal life, which means hopefully we could bring out skills into the world to solve these very real giant existential crises that we're facing. Um, like you said, climate being one of them, population, inequality, um, divisiveness, violence, things like this that are running rampant. And um, it, it's interesting how technology has just expanded in the last 50 years to now we almost have things that can reach, we have things that can reach satellites in our pockets. And, and yet the science fiction writers of the 1930s and 40s were writing about robots doing our dishes but not just a dishwasher like you know doing chores around the house and making our lives easier and it's kind of been ironic right now maybe we're still in the infancy of this but it almost seems like all of a lot of these 
helpers that we have around the house are only slightly compensating. So Alexa, you know, the Amazon bot, the dishwasher, they're slightly compensating for our increasingly sped up lives and uh, increasingly confusing lives. And uh, what I mean by that is the post-truth stuff that's coming around that's causing even more problems is that the agreed upon narrative is not there due to uh, contrasting agendas, I would say. Um, we could get into that further. Um, but you know, psychology is very much needing to speed up also to meet the demand, not only with therapists, uh, which is highly effective. We know that it is very effective and it helps people, you know, in the long run, but all the people that therapy is not reaching as children are all the, we, we, you know, it's almost as if we need to start combining disciplines like counseling and mental health skills and coping skills need to be taught in schools from day one. All public schools need to learn different ways to regulate your emotions uh, we need to have public schools teaching how to ha have communication and dialogue and critical thinking and learn about relationships and boundaries and all of these things that are not being taught. Um, and for, oh, how to navigate financial things and how to use technology, technology appropriately, because it's a great tool, but it can also be used for terrible things as well. And we are in a mental health crisis, I think, because the grand narratives that uh, humans were using for our myth making and meaning making and things are sort of breaking down. Um, you know, different types of community things are are growing up. I mean, there's new things growing all the time, but there's a lot of entropy uh, at trusted institutions um, at that level. So, among other crises, so I mean, there's so many things we could go on here explaining all this, but the fact is, is that there's a mental health crisis, and there's been one before COVID, and now with uh, the uh, quarantines and the social disruption and the disease and everything going on, it's cast a shadow and cast a light rather on a, a lot of glaring issues that we're facing, um, and of course, mental health being a large one. I mean, in in almost every case you hear of somebody. Uh, committing acts of senseless violence. They name, they're they now naming mental health. Um, domestic violence, they're naming mental health. Substance and drug abuse, they're naming mental health. Um, <laughs> uh, people in positions of power making terrible decisions that no one likes, they're now claiming it's, you know, there's mental health. So what is mental health? I mean, that, it's such a large thing, but uh, it's not mind control. We want people to be healthy and we want people to feel, you know, some sense of well-being, like you said, and have a purpose. And the purpose, uh, hopefully, is something that serves more than just yourself. Because if that's what you're living for, you you won't be satisfied. Um, so I see. I see. Uh, I'm excited. I, I've I've used some technology products myself, uh, and I'm getting into more of them. For instance, I've been thinking about. Um, how people are making online courses and how to's and helpful things. Uh, and that's great to reach a larger audience because people don't have time. But I think the other problem is if people don't have time and they're getting all of their advice from online, it's, it's also speaking to a larger problem, which is the nervous system is going to be constantly activated at all times. And then people don't have the ability to stress reduce. Um, I like online therapy, but I think it's best used as hybrid. I think in person is very, healing and uh, useful. But I do think the idea of having online therapy or online courses or online meditations in adjunct with some type of in-person can really help and also possibly reach more people faster than all these devices that are coming out. Like, I don't know if you've heard about Muse, um, which trains your brain to sort of breathe and slow down. I have the Muse. I love it. I've been using it. But then again, it's like if you don't use it, then it's not helping you. There was a device called the Spire, which is something you put on your belt loop and it feels your breathing and it buzzes you when you get into a... Um, it buzzes your body or beeps at you when you get into a tense breathing pattern. So that was something I found that helped me out at work. I suppose all these new digital watches are also helping. I haven't used those yet, but apparently they keep track of all sorts of metrics. The issue is, what do we do with this stuff? And how are we going to help it add to our 
health and benefit instead of just adding another to do like, oh, did you, you know, it's like you can imagine the science fiction writer saying, okay, this robot's going to take care of your whole house. And then you come home and you have less, you have more leisure time. Well, we've just increased our workload. I think since the 2008 financial crisis, we've seen that worker productivity has skyrocketed and wages have stagnated. So what's going on with that? Um, that's a whole issue. So, so I got to program the vacuuming robot, the dishwashing robot, um, you know, all these things. And then do I really have more time? Because now the, the rug robot has eaten my rug and the dishwasher didn't do it right. So I got to redo it. So, you know, like, how are we, how are we, um, you know, how are we actually improving our lives? What is your, give us some hope here. What, what tech can help us here with our mental wellness and stress maybe, and then we'll go maybe to purpose. Yeah. I mean, I, um, just for some specific examples that I love, I, I have the aura ring on, you know, I, I wear it every night. I track my sleep. Um, and you know, and that's just such a big part of well being is, is, you know, getting some good sleep hygiene in place. Um, and so I love that. Another one that I just really love because it's simple and it's cheap is, um, it's a device called touch points and, uh, they're basically two little buzzers. Um, and they're about $140 and, uh, for the pair and you put them on either side of the body. Um, so one in one pocket, one in the other. And what it does is it, it thumps at a low enough level that it doesn't distract you from doing what you're doing, but it's a high enough level that your nervous system starts tracking it. So I call it the inner lizard. Like it's like, it's, it's consistent enough that, you know, the, the inner lizard, that is your, um, you know, that is your, or your fight or flight, uh, you know, mechanism. Um, it starts to watch it. And so, uh, and, and that's just, you know, that's just a very like layman description of what's happening. Um, but you know, what it does is it drops stress, um, you know, really dramatically. So if you're about to give a speech, if you're about to, you know, uh, if you're about to do something that causes you a great deal of anxiety, what it does is it helps drop out the physiological part of it because you can only track so many things, you know, at a, at a point. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that people can, um, you know, stop that ramp up of, you know, uh, the psychology, the hardware driving this, I mean, the software driving the hardware driving the software, or, you know, you have a thought, um, you become, you know, you become anxious that turns into an adrenaline cortisol rush that then you're on the roller coaster until you're off the roller coaster. Um, so you have that physiological component that then, you know, then you have the experience of anxiety, which fans the flame of content. Um, and so what's great about these two things, it's just like, it's super cheap and it just works. And, um, in their, you know, in their studies in their clinical studies, um, you see like 60 to 70% drops in the physiological response, you know, stress responses, um, you know, within, one to two minutes of having these little thumpers in your pocket. So you don't have to do anything. You don't have to learn anything. You just stick them in your pocket. Um, great for speeches, great for meetings, great for negotiation, great for any sort of like experience that makes you anxious. Um, you know, but where I think uh, to answer your first question about, or what you were leading to, uh, one of the things that, that, you know, one of my philosophies is, um, what I call the pearl and thread. And, um, and so imagine a pearl necklace and, and there's big spaces between them and then there's threads. And so when I think about these technologies, I don't believe in replacing something that is, you know, that is already extraordinary. So, you know, there is no replacement for a talented therapist, none, like a talented therapist, coach, clinician, um, you know, top of the crap, zero, you know, there's no way you can replace it. That is a pearl. Technology is really just the thread between pearls. So, you know, imagine, you know, with all of the people that, you know, you or your colleagues have seen, um, you know, like one of the big, big problems that, you know, therapists talk about is, you know, well, while you might, you know, 
in a professional capacity, be okay with the person sitting in your chair. The number of times when a client comes in and they immediately begin projecting their problem onto you. So the fit problem on the client side, uh, you know, where there's a mismatch and no matter what you do, you're their daddy, you know, or you're their mother or whatever, you know, whatever it is, like there's a, you know, there's a fit problem where they don't feel chemistry, you know, and, you know, and you've probably seen, you know, the number of people who come to a first session and never come to a second. And, and a lot of it in some of those exit, you know, things, it's like, I just didn't feel, I didn't feel safe. It's a chemistry issue. It's a matching issue. Um, and so, you know, if there are ways to like better match people, um, so they actually stick in the first meeting, that's great because also when people don't stick and they, they have a bad first experience, they never come back. They never, ever, ever come back. They don't try it again. Sometimes they do if they've got a big problem, but for the most part, they don't. So a really great use of technology is just to try to help a little bit better with fit. Right now, when people are looking for a therapist, um, they get a list from their HMO that tells them who they're allowed to see. They dial for dollars. They see who's available. And it's like, there's, there's like nothing, you know, in that mix. Um, and so, you know, we get a lot of people crashing out if they even get an appointment. So, you know, using technology for fit, you know, uh, already, uh, and it helps the, it helps the client, it helps the therapist. But then the second part is, you know, one of the things when I've spoken to therapists, um, they say things like, or when I've asked them what their problems are, they say things like, you know, it takes three sessions for the client to stop lying, <laughs> you know, often because they want you to like them. Right. Um, or, you know, you know, something happened in the moment and a week later, you're, they're trying to remember what triggered them and, and it's hard. And so, you know, seeing the therapist as the pearl, a great role of technology is, you know, for a client to be able to, you know, get in the moment, help reminders or to say, oh, I got really upset and to have an easy way to track it. Um, and so it's preparation so that when they're with you, um, you know, they can really do the work. They don't have to try to remember but they can actually do the work with a real thing. Um, and then, and then uh, integration, because like, you know, revelation without integration, you know, that person, you know, those are the people who are in therapy. <laughs> you know, they just keep doing it again and again and again. Um, and so, you know, you know, so and then also the last thing I'll say is the most successful and by success, I mean, you know, uh, evidence-based clinically effective products I've seen are ones that, you know, have a solid philosophy of humans in the loop. So it's not that you're off on your own, you know, using some app, though there's certainly a place for that. You know, I would rather someone use an app than have nothing at all. Um, but, you know, where we should be designing for and working with therapists, you know, and the mental health community to make the best stuff uh, is uh, for things that, um, you know, really work for them and the clients and where the human is, you know, in the loop in some way. And that's the most effective. Humans need humans to change. Yes, I agree with that completely. Um, interestingly, I've been thinking, I've already standardized some things you've talked about at my own clinic here is that I noticed that one of the biggest issues with uh, clients is they don't come back after the first meeting. And my issue was, yes, that's matching. So what we did at our clinic is we did extensive website reviews of everybody's philosophy, bio, multiple pictures. Some of the clinicians did videos. Then the second thing we did was, so that's using technology of just a website. The second thing we did was we absolutely not only have our front desk people screen, but we actually do a 15 minute free phone call with everybody before we will intake them at all into our counseling. And I noticed a, almost every clinic I've talked to in the area and even maybe state that I'm aware of does not do that. They have their intake screener people do that. We have our therapists do that. We have 15 minutes free because if we're going to be a good fit, we're going to, we want to make sure it's a good fit. And if it's not, we're going to, we're going to make sure that we, you didn't already start an appointment with us and get invested and then feel disrupted. Um, so that's number two thing we're doing. Um, I think there's probably more to it. I think you could probably have personality quizzes or something in an intake versus does that fit with your, 
your therapist, but a lot of it, clients are going to project onto you. So having photographs and videos of you talking, and then also having a free phone call, I think would help with both parties. So we do that. Um, I think that's very important to get people engaged and then to use apps or things like this. So I have not standardized this, but a lot of my clients, when I come in, I say, do you want to get the most out of this? They say, yeah. I said, okay, well, here's the deal. Like mindfulness based stress reduction has been proven since the eighties. And before then it was proven in non Western medicine to help with your stress. So here's apps, here's a app you know, Ed's headspace or insight timer where you can start learning to do this on your own every day. If you do that, you're going to feel better and we're gonna be able to work on getting to the root causes or the root issues here so we can get you out of the out of here sooner and get you back into life. Um, another thing that I'll say to clients is I say, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but do you want recommendations? I'll say, I recommend you talk to your doctor about what kind of exercises you can do. I recommend you get involved in a community group whether it be on Zoom or whether it be in person. So that the therapy, it's not just dependent exactly on the therapist. The issue is we have to be careful about standardizing it too much so clients don't just feel like we're coming in and giving them five assignments, right? So that's the trouble. I've been trying to figure out how to standardize that. I standardize the intakes where we always make sure we do the 15-minute free phone call to make sure it's a good fit. And lots of times that saved us from, you know, this client and I just didn't get along. I so I transferred over here and they they did much better with this person. So we're not being possessive, you know, of the clients um, and, and letting them have some choice. But I do see when I get a client to do some mindfulness-based meditation or t- their chosen type of exercise or get connected with a social group, I, I they are not in therapy that long. They're maybe in therapy three to six months, you know, or less. Um, and I'm saying, okay, I think we're in maintenance mode now. Or we're getting there faster. So... The issue is the issue is can I use technology to integrate all of these things? I think yes. The hard part is we only have 53 minutes, thanks insurance companies, and you know we've got to you know write all these empirically proven things and help them with the intervention and then give all these recommendations without being pushy because people don't like being pushed around and told what to do. Um, so I like to use the community reinforcement approach, which is. We need community. We need different things to reinforce our mental health. We can't just depend on the therapist because that's the next step to just going to the doctor and saying, I'm depressed. Give me a pill. I'm not going to work on anything else. Yeah. So I don't know what your thoughts are. Well, so just a, a couple of amazing things. One, I love what you've done with your, essentially with your onboarding. I'm really curious. Um, did you, what was the, um, did you measure the change in, um, you know, adherence? Like uh, in the sense of like, uh, you had said that when when you had misfit, you could track it. When you made that change, did you see you know, uh, you know, essentially, uh, you know what I'm asking? Our return rate, yes. So our return rate after intake one, after session one at my clinic with fourteen therapists, is about ninety eight percent. Awesome. And so that I think is about as good as you can get. And I've been tracking that. Um, whereas other clinics I know, and I worked at clinics that did this, the return rate was 50, 70, something like that, because they were not having the therapist start the rapport at the intake or at the before the intake to make sure it was a good fit. And they got to the intake. And what do you do with the intake? The medical community has dictated and the state has dictated that we have to ask you all these questions about your childhood and your personal life and what's going wrong and what's going wrong with this and what's going wrong with that and are you suicidal and are you using drugs and alcohol and do you have a spiritual practice we have to ask all this so what i i tell my clinicians to do is let's do that 15 minutes if it goes well that's right there establishing rapport and hope secondly spend the first 15 minutes not asking any questions answering questions talking about what you guys can do together and then say What I say is I say, you know, blame the medical establishment. We do have to do this. Now, it is best practice to do this, right? But it'd be nice if we had a little bit longer to do it. So then spend the next 45 minutes going, hey, you know what? I just have to answer these questions, and then we can get to the therapy. Little does the client know the first 15 minutes on the phone for free was therapy, and the first 15 minutes of that intake was therapy. Now you guys are getting along, and you can see that, and then they're much more happy to answer your questions versus 
me sitting there like we just got into some sort of interview and I say, tell me about this. Tell me about that. Are you smoking? Are you this? What's your family history before I even, you even like me. So like, no wonder people don't come back to therapy. They didn't even get therapy on the first appointment at a lot of clinics. So, so that's the tough part about that. The issue is that's not standardized. I mean, I, I, I came up with that because I, and a few of my friends in Arizona who are, I'm a clinician there as well, but a few of my friends in Arizona were doing it too. Cause they just felt like, you know, I don't, I'm not just going to say, okay, well your insurance matches our schedule matches. See you Friday. Like I'm not, you know, no, we need to have a conversation. What are you even looking to get out of it? And are you in the right place? For instance, one of the things we've done here is when somebody comes in with a severe alcohol and drug problem, we don't have the, we don't have a, a psychiatrist on staff. We don't have a detox on staff. So we all say, Hey, you know what? Here's the deal right now. Ethically, I can't intake you into my practice. I've got to send you to this treatment center in town. Here's where you can go. After that, come call me. But like, here you go. Here's three referrals. And therefore, we're not getting that mismatch. So that's one of the ways we, we've used technology. But um, I want to know a little bit more about what you what these transformative technologies are and uh, in your expertise about maybe some of the ways that they can actually not just benefit by tracking our sleep, which is essential. It's funny. Everything starts with sleep, right? Are you sleeping? Are you eating Correct. You know, somewhat mindful foods? Or are we just kind of letting the world uh, make up our schedule for us? Uh, but I want to know a little bit about maybe how these technologies can, I don't know, like you said, help us with our purpose. I mean, that's a big mm. one. Yeah. Well, uh, the first I have to, you know, I want to reflect to you while you were talking about what you were doing. I felt so much, um, so much respect and admiration and excitement in my, my body. And, um, you know, if you get in, if you get inspired to, you know, actually like turning that front end to, into a, um, you know, productizing that front end in a way that can train other, you know, therapy offices to do that. Um, you know, let's talk about it. Cause it's like, there's, you know, like, have you ever seen those logo builders where you pick five logos or in the, and then it goes to, it's like AI logo building where you pick like different, uh, logos and then it gives you another set and another set. And then that's how it sort of like figures out what your tastes are. Oh, I've heard of, yes, I actually have, uh, I actually did one of those ones. Yeah. Imagine that with just a voice snippet you know, like just a voice snippet, like that could be very interesting too. Um, just to like, you know, even get you more in the right direction. Oh, I see. So here's a clip of your counselor talking about themselves for one minute. What do you think? Yeah. Or, you know, or, or a little bit less, you know, like it, cause it's like, like, for example, I'll tell you something funny. So, um, I can, so, you know, I'm single, I date, I can hear someone's voice and know if it's going to, if it's even possible. Like I can just, like, I could just know from the voice, um, you know, and, and a very short conversation. Um, and so just like here, so I wonder we would have to, like, this is something we would test. This is something. And so this is an example of how, you know, uh, you know, mental health professionals can partner with technologists. Like this is something that we would, you know, we would test this. We would see if, you know, uh, you know, short voice files, you know, um, y- y- presented like that um, helps, you know, ensure a, a greater fit. Um, and you would still do all of those other things, but um, then you would have a greater likelihood of the clinician and the therapist who's doing that intake therapy. You already would have tightened it a little bit. Um, you know, so, you know, rather than sort of like, you know, batting rather than like maybe batting 60 on tight fit, you know, you're already in the nineties, you know, before you do the pre-therapy. So those are the types of things, you know, when, when technologists really understand the problem set, um, at, you know, that, that, that the people who are on the ground are doing that we can like collaborate to be like, oh, this is a, a way to do it. And then, you know, we work really closely with a lot of, uh, you know, researchers and we really believe in, you know, validation, you know, right now, um, uh, well, actually that's not what you t- t- asked me. I'm just sort that's of like okay. went off on a tangent. No, why don't we, why don't we just go on the tangent? It's cool. You know, that's okay. I'm well, all, I'm all about that. Well, it's like, so one of the challenges, so everybody's got their bias, right? Mm-hmm. 
Um, and so the do-gooder bias is that um, is that if it's good for you, then it doesn't matter how painful and terrible uh, the UI UX is. And if it's like, you know, if it's total suffering to use the product, it's good for you. It's sort of like, so that that's how do-gooders are. Um, technologist, um, you know, once they get a technology, it's like they have a hammer and everything's a nail. So, oh, you can do it with VR. Oh, that with VR and this with VR and that with VR, you know? And so it's like the, the technology becomes the, the driving force as opposed to the human it's serving. Um, and then, you know, the challenge with the medical community is, um, you know, when they think about technology, typically um, they want the entire intervention to exist inside of whatever the app is. So when you look at, you know, when you, you sort of like, if you might read some of the articles that come out about mental health apps and some things like that, you know, it's like, it's like everything has to happen in this intervention point, as opposed to which kind of like what you've done is drawing it out, you know, and, and, and so, and this goes back to the, the pearl and the thread too. It's like the, you know, when you, when you expand the scope, not everything about the intervention has to happen in the software, you know? And so when you, when you open your mind and consider it a full, you know, customer journey, because like what you're talking about, the way you're running your practice is kind of how, you know, like the, the luxury hotels run their businesses, you know, in the way that they, they actually like the super elite hotels, they know who is coming and what they like, you know? Um, and, and so it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a very uh, personalized sort of approach. So, you know, the world is sort of moving towards customer experiences. Uh, corporate is starting to think about like some of the new companies are thinking of employees as customers of the companies that they work in, as opposed to widgets, you know, in the, you know, widgets to be used. Um, and so you're going to see that everywhere. And so, you know, so you're, you know, one of the things, I, one of the things that I love about you already is, uh, you know, you're on the ground, uh, you noticed a problem and, you know, and you have, uh, you know, are really an, an early adopter and sort of pioneer thinking uh, about how to become more effective in this space. And what's really nice is that, you know, there's other, there's other uh, industries where people are figuring out the same thing. Um, so, so, so there's, so there's that. And so, you know, um, one of the things that we do is, you know, I really believe in efficacy as well. Um, but I also believe in innovation. And, and so the space that's really good is the place where, um, you know, the clinicians in the medical community really engages with technology, um, you know, and, and to, to help us like, you know, figure out and, and experiment and try things and test them. Um, so we can build good things together. Um, and so, yeah, so that was my, that was my rant. I'm sorry. I just got a little too excited about your the way you do things. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, I essentially didn't start a clinic because I wanted to become a business person, but I guess I am now. But I started a clinic because I was really annoyed at how other clinics were being run and how places I had worked at functioned from a customer service standpoint. If I have to think through everything about what a new client or new patient is going through. First of all, it took a lot of guts for them to look you up on the internet and call you. So they have to, and, and then there's all the stigma around mental health, right? I'm going to see a therapist. What does that mean? So I, I need to make this as easy as possible, but I also have to make them feel like they've got agency and choice. And then thirdly, I need to make sure that I am not screwing up and putting the wrong counselor with the wrong client. I want them to find out before we start exchanging money. So essentially, that's kind of where I went with that. And I would love to, you know, I, I know Psychology Today, the website has actually been getting a bit more innovative, and they've actually been having therapists record 30 second video introductions, not everybody's been doing it. But I actually think, I think a lot of therapists are scared to do it. But then again, these might be the same therapists who put these pictures up. And I'm like, you didn't get a professional photographer. I'm like, you know, here's the deal. We all we all have our days where we look good, or where we might not look so inviting. But I tell, I tell my clinicians, I say, people, you know, 
you may have the skills, but people are also going to look at you and they're going to judge you subconsciously based on people they know. And you have to have a smile that says, hey, I'm approachable. I'm here. I can talk to you. You, you it can't be like a half you know, the lighting is terrible and you look like you're having a bad day and you're like, I'm just taking this photo for my profile. You know, we have to think about these sort of things that are going to help, you know, clinicians because they're going to spend a lot of time with you. And it's a relationship with the healthcare practitioner. And one of the biggest things I've found is that if people believe in you as a healthcare practitioner and they believe in your model, they're going to adhere more to whatever goals they make. And that's in the research. And if you have better rapport, if you have rapport, they're saying that's 90% of the treatment effect in counseling comes from the rapport alone. And yet we spend all our time trying to come up with new techniques. So maybe we need to learn how to help treat people in a way that makes them feel heard and special and, and, and that we understand so that then they can make those changes. And that's hopefully what technology can do as well as customize to people, um, Little things, and you're right, it, it can't be the whole enchilada is coming through technology that feels so cold. I don't think people like that. I, I can tell already. I mean, my clinician, my my clients tell me, uh, I like you better in person, but I'm glad we're doing this telehealth thing. I mean, it's it's fine, you know, and as and it, it's useful because if I, you know, have to go somewhere and I'm still working, well, I can see them, and then when I'm back in my office, I can see them. So that, that I guess the issue is technology should be a helper and a tool to kind of keep us and guide us on track. At the same time, the same technology on your phone or on your laptop can be the great distractor, which can then lead us to more non, <laughs> I don't know, nourishing activities. Or Absolutely. Well, I know um, I, I, you've asked a couple of times for examples. Um, so I'll give you one um, that, that I love. So I have disabled all of my notifications except for one. I have an app called Mind Jogger where I can write my own notifications. And so my notifications are things like, how am I attending to my deepest emotional needs in this moment? So I get the notification and it says that. And, and, and I have the practice of pausing and asking, how am I attending to my deepest emotional needs in this moment? And it's really like the, the quality of, of life that that has had for me, like just, and, um, and because, you know, the, the way that the brain works, as soon as something becomes non-novel, it becomes less effective. So, you know, I have a set of, of affirmations or a, a set of questions like that, that, you know, presence me, remind me what I'm working on. And then when they start to get a little less, you know, when I start to adhere a little bit less, I feel them a little bit less. You know, one of the, the things about positive psychology is that it it always works except um, as it decays. So, you know, if you're grateful for the same thing four days in a row, um, exit, you know, entry exit study, actually on the fourth day, you're less grateful. So if you say grateful for your health every day, on the fourth day, you're actually less grateful. So a way that technology can help you is to give you a different prompt on different days so that maybe you only get the health prompt, you know, every, you, you know, seven days, four days, 12 days, but that not knowing what's coming keeps you at maximum gratitude. And so technology can help us you know, manage these, you know, these, these uh, decay curves, similar to the way that when you work out with a coach in a gym, you're, you know, you do a little bit more weight, you put a little bit more effort in there, you know, when, you know, because of that novel situation. But, um, you know, one thing that I could imagine, you know, with a, with a client is like with memory jogger, I could imagine, you know, you and your client, you know, uh, crafting some prompts, that are very specific to their situation and you change them, you know, like, you know, at the, at the end of every session, you agree to which the ones they are, and then you change them. And so you're changing them every month, but it's things like, it's things like that. Um, and that's, you know, the app is two ninety nine. Um, you know, it's called it mind is, jogger or memory jogger. Um, hold on, let me, uh, <laughs> I'm just it's curious. a good one. Yeah, I know. I, I like this one a lot. Like, well, it reminds yeah. me while we're looking it up. What's it called? It's called Mind Jogger. 
Mind jogger. Okay. Definitely a very cool idea because I lo- I didn't know that that was totally evidence-based, but I had, I had ascertained that if you do the same intervention all the time in therapy, clients don't like that. So I, I instru- I'm a supervisor of a lot of clinicians and I say, listen, change it up. I know we're using the same techniques and you know, you can, it's kind of like, I give this analogy. Um, there are really good musicians out there that read music, right? And you go to the classical symphony and you know what's coming. And if you've heard this song before, you're going to love it, right? And you're, you're hearing Brahms symphony or Mozart or whatever. But, you know, I'm sorry, it gets old. And, uh, you know, it's beautiful the first time you hear it. But if you go to see the symphony five weeks in a row, you're over it. So guess what? You're not over jazz music. So jazz musicians are playing the same songs that we've been hearing for the last hundred years and some new ones, but what they do is they play it differently every time. And so you don't know what's happening. And, um, right now I'm two, two hours away from Chicago. I used to live in Chicago full time. And there is a place on the North side called the green mill. And it's this old jazz lounge and you can go there seven nights a week and never Mm. get bored because the jazz musicians that play there, they might even be playing the same songs, but they never play it the same way. And so I tell my, clinicians i say listen rituals are important how are you doing let's talk about where are we at with anxiety stress how is how is the uh how is your coping skill how how is the communication thing you tried you know definitely a beginning and an end but then you have to be improvisational use the fact that you know how to do therapy inventions like musicians can read music but play it differently so even even EMDR therapy, play it differently, which is a very standardized process. Otherwise, your clinician's going to go, you're just repeating yourself. You're like a like a parrot, you know? This is not, your clients are not going to like that. So I, I think just keeping it fresh and and moving around. So with my clinician, with my clients, I try to change it up. Like we'll be doing an, a, a very specific intervention one week and then next week we'll not do that same intervention. We'll do a different one, right? Even though it's the same problem. Because otherwise they're bored, and their brain's recognizing it, and it's and it might be, I think, unconsciously, and maybe according to studies, I'm not sure, but my theory is unconsciously resisting me doing the same thing with them. It doesn't have the same effect. Yeah, well, you know what it is is it's sort of like you know, um, life, um, and if you look across like the biosphere and a bunch of other things, you know, life is about conserving energy. Everything that it's alive, you know, draws in energy and seeks to conserve it. Uh, So conserving calories, um, you know, whether it's plants or people or whatever. And so, you know, your, our, you know, from our, you know, our origins on the Serengeti and whatnot, um, your brain seeks to conserve calories and to conserve energy. Um, you know, it consumes most of, you know, a, a huge chunk of the, the calories that you consume every day are used by your brain function. Um, and so as soon and our brains are pattern matching, you know, mechanisms, um, and then they also are filters. Like if a human was actually completely, if we were ever fully exposed to um, all of the sound waves, all of the light spectrum, you know, everything that we notice, it's why that gorilla test where, you know, there's something in the foreground and there's a gorilla and the guy and a gorilla sitting in the back and no one noticed. It's because the, the brain is filtering. The brain is uh, conserving our, our physiologies are filtering. The brain's filtering. Our physiologies are conserving calories. So the moment something becomes a known thing, you know, your brain's off of it. And so on one hand, it's that, you know, it's, it's um, on one hand, it's, you know, one could call it boredom, but really it's like the, the decay of novelty makes it a known thing. And, and that lessens the attention, uh, because to pay attention is to burn, you know, attention, you know, is, is a a form of energy and, and, you know, and, uh, that kind of thing and focus. So it's sort of a natural thing. And it's like, if we just know how our brains work and know how our, our bodies work, um, then, then we can know how to, you know, what to modulate and, and when. Um, so, but something that you said at the top of the hour too, that I really want to come back to that I thought was, you know, brilliant was, uh, you know, when you talked about how, when you work with your clients um, and you tell them that if they meditate, um, you know, the, that at times, you know, the process will go smoother, faster and finish up, you know, and, and you give them that as an option. 
Um, that would be also a wonderful thing. Like I, I haven't actually, I realized I haven't looked at any, looked for any studies um, that show, um, you know, the impact of these, you know, combined or supportive interventions on the effectiveness of the actual, like, you know, therapeutic process. That would be really, you know, that would be really fascinating to, you know, to set up some, you know, studies and see if we could, I don't know how we would control for that, but yeah, that, that'd be tough, that would but be I, great. I, I'll tell you why I base that on. So here's what I base those three things on. There are hundreds, maybe thousands now of studies showing that if people did mindfulness-based stress reduction for 20 to 30 minutes a day or transcendental meditation, which is more difficult, that they had increased gray matter, better stress response, better test scores, better sleep, clarity, all, I mean, name it. I mean, they've, they've proven it with these studies, you know, with that intentional um, concentration and meditation. There are so many studies showing that if people exercise, that their anxiety and depression symptoms go down and decrease. And there are so many studies showing that social engagement with the pro-social activities with people you feel safe around or even over Zoom connecting to people um, improve humans' mood and well-being. So I just took all those studies and I'm like, those are my three things. I mean, there's more things I tell people to try out, but those are the three things I really love, right? I mean, also bibliotherapy, like reading a really good book or um, listening to a really interesting podcast can help make your mind creative again and less depressed or less anxious because you're focusing on something that is actually within your control. So, I mean, there's, I took those studies, which are, there's hundreds in each category. And I just thought, well, hell, if I have one of, if I have my client do one of these things while they're in therapy and I ask about it every week and they're actually doing it, watch the results. And it, and it's true. I, the clients who I see take one of these things up as a discipline or maybe even switch it up. I said, listen, I'm not looking for even an A, B, or an a C grade. I'm saying if you can set a goal to do this three times a week or four times a week or whatever, and that's like only 30 to 50% of your week, that's all I need. Then, and then you're doing something for yourself outside of therapy. And if that occurs, I see a huge speed up in um, symptom reduction and also quality. And then if there is deep trauma or some huge PTSD trigger going on, it helps me be able to get to the bottom of it faster and be able to use the appropriate intervention such as EMDR therapy or some other trauma-informed therapy to help help their uh, their response to that uh, flashback or that trigger go away faster. And I, I just saw it the other day. I had a client and he, he started meditating every day <laughs> and he comes in and he's like, I'm in a really good mood. I'm in a really good place. And I was like, really, what's going on? He's like, well, I've been meditating for the last three weeks since I saw you. And we were talking and he like had this and he's bringing up all these sorts of other things that he wanted to talk about. And I said at the end, I said, honestly, here's the deal. Like I can, I have to literally put you on maintenance. Your, your symptoms are gone. Like that you came in here for, I can't continue to charge insurance companies. So you could pay me cash, but I can't, I can't run this through insurance past uh, and every three or four week check-in to make sure that you're still doing okay. And he laughed really hard and he's like, dang, he's like, well, I'll have to think of something to be depressed about. But he was like, in a, he couldn't, he was in a jolly mood and he went home and he's, so he see me in a month. So that's the sort of result that can happen. But the hard part is when people come in, usually they're so symptomatic that doing these activities is so hard, hard. you know, to even start. So if I can get them to do it in my office, I can't get them to exercise in my office, but I can teach them meditation. I can show them things to try. Then it's just, it's, and then it's just the same thing as the technology, the tech, using technology in all those aspects, you know, to find the exercise place, to use the meditation applications, to find a community. We're using technology. So it's pairing it together. Uh, to be able to better their lives. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I've only seen, so I've seen one, oh, I know, it's just, it's so good. Um, I've seen one study that was um, a combination of exercise and meditation, um, you know, and um, the, the combination of exercise and meditation, and I don't remember the exact number, so I, I'm, you know, I'm sure I'm going to get this wrong, but it was like, it was startlingly, startlingly significant of like an, an increase in the decrease, you know, of depressive symptoms. And they were using the, the gold standard measures. Um, and like, and it was like, it was significant enough that you're like, holy, holy moly, 
you know, those things go together well. And so, um, you know, so I think it'd be really like, I'm just so curious. It'd be really interesting to see if you could, how they really stack. So, you know, so you could say, so it's beyond, you know, all of these things have a body of evidence to actually this combination. Like if you're here to get it done, you know, then, 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 then this is actually proven that these two things in combination. And if you want to get it more done, like do all three, you know, that kind of thing. So, so that, that's kind of cool. Um, you know, but I agree with you. It's like, you know, also it's like, it's so very hard to, you know, if you're depressed, it's really hard to be motivated to do all of these things. And so that just gets us all the way sort of back to the, the basics. What are the, what are the little things? Um, some things that might help is, um, I'm really obsessed by, um, you know, some of the early research on the impact of light, sound, and temperature on the way that human beings feel. And so, you know, one of the things that, that you know, for some people can make a really big difference um, is basically the sound environment that they're in, you know? Um, and so, like, if you've ever gone into, you know, a, a, um, you know, an environment and suddenly felt on knees and felt a little bit like a lab rat, it might be because um, you know, of, of sound. Like I personally know I cannot be around discordant sound, uh, and feel at ease. Um, and so it's just, you know, it's just something that, that I've come to know uh, about myself. Um, you know, my, my office mate and I have different tastes in music and I'm just like, you know, and he's like, it's classical. I was like, no, but it's got too many waves in the, in the waveform of the music. And it keeps me, it keeps me on edge. Um, and so, you know, things that we might be able to do, you know, there's been, you know, what's exciting about this era is that there are a lot of things that we sort of anecdotally know are true, but we don't evidence know they're true. And we couldn't evidence know they're true because we don't have the ability to sense, you know, to get data sets large enough to, you know, see patterns, test theories, um, you know, and then see, you know, you know, what is or isn't true um, so that then it can be replicable for other humans. You know, that takes you into huge areas around data privacy, ethics, and sovereignty and, and things like that as you start to make these things. But, you know, I think, a, you know, a, one of the a category of product that I'm really excited about um, is ultimately, um, you know, widespread continuous glucose monitoring. Um, you know, like when it gets down to a form factor that it's a sticker and that the needles aren't scary and you can buy it non-prescription in a Walgreens next to the gum. And you, then you can see the impact of everything that you eat on your glucose levels because mood and glucose are very tied together, you know? And so to get to the point place where maybe we can use the grocery store, you know, as that supplement you know, um, you know, like how we're eating and, and not in some sort of, you know, um, you know, guru weird diet, you know, based on basically nothing, but it's actually, you know, you know, what Paul eats, um, how that, you know, has him have consistent glucose levels or not, and how that contributes to his irritation, um, you know, open-mindedness, um, you know, and, and reactivity, you know, like everybody who's married understands hangry, <laughs> you know, like it's actually a thing, right? Oh, it's a thing. Um, it's totally a thing. Um, and so, you know, that's what technology allows us to do, but philosophically and more important, and you asked me this, and we didn't talk about it. You know, sometimes when I talk about, you know, sort of like all of the understanding uh, and the insight that we, that we get, people worry about, um, are we over, are we over technology, you know, are, are we over teching ourselves like these simple little things, you know, um, if you go into your garden, you kind of know what to eat, like, you know, foraging societies and things like that. Um, you know, and so for me, when I think about it, um, it's more that I absolutely believe, you know, in the, uh, in the mystery and magic of human life. You know, uh, my call this morning was with a, an astronaut and we were talking about the explorer mindset. Um, and so, you know, I think what would be a really great outcome for us 
is that, you know, I do not believe we should resist measuring the things that we can that allow us to have more distributed access and understanding for well-being. You know, the amount of, of you know, human contribution that we lose through mental illness, through, um, you know, through uh, depression, through, you know, people being disengaged, adrift. Um, you know, it's like, how many Einsteins have we lost, you know, to mental illness this year that didn't even know that's who they were yet? And so, you know, raising the floor, you know, I'm all about it. Early on, you talked about things, um, you know, that should be taught in school. Well, and I agree with you, but often when you raise those, the feedback is that we don't have enough money to teach all the kids all this stuff. Well, technology, you know, and designed and like some of the examples that we've talked about, you know, like if you really worked with teachers and, it, and it's really coming from, you know, how do we allow our teachers to be superhumans, you know, like, and, and, and it's supportive and not eliminating people, not seeing people as like a resource to be a widget to be, you know, decosted, but, you know, really as, you know, making technology a platform for these people, then, you know, then these technologies, um, when they become allies to the pearls, the teachers and the therapist and, you know, and the people in our society that help with that inner landscape, um, you know, then it is no longer a viable argument to say that we cannot afford it. Um, and so, you know, if we raise the floor through these types of things, then I also believe that simultaneously we should raise the ceiling of the unknowing because the not knowing and the exploration is a fundamental part you know, of, of the, of human nature. And then, you know, like I'm looking forward to, you know, the, like I was talking to someone about it and I was like, you know, I'm ready for us to have some new problems, you know, like, let's get some new problems. Like, you know, like it would be wonderful if in, you know, 50 years from now, you and I have another podcast and you say, you know, these kids today, they just won't do solo consciousness. Like they don't understand to be alone inside your head, you know, and not to feel universally connected to all of life and other people. It's just a good, you know, it's, it's a good rite of passage, <laughs> you know, like let's get some new problems. And so, you know, uh, that's, you know, that's my philosophy about it. And, and I think the resistance to measuring the things that we can, um, you know, the pendulum on that far side to create tools that raise the floor keeps us from, you know, addressing these things. And, um, and if we raise the floor, then, you know, we can look further, you know, and get into, you know, the big fundamental question of, you know, who am I must be answered to contribute to who are we. And humanity is at a place right now where we are, you know, 10 to 15 years out from being more on a path towards Hunger Games or more on a path towards Starfleet. Starfleet. Like, like the stakes are large. Um, there's time, but the stakes are large. And so, you know, we have to get to the place where we could even be in the conversation about what does it mean to be human? What are we here to create? What sort of societies do we want to live in? Um, and for that, we have to have, you know, the, you know, the resourcefulness and the character, you know, and the fearlessness that comes from psychological help, uh, you know, to be able to, to, you know, craft that. Um, and so that's really what this is all about. Well, I think that is an excellent summary of, you know, what, it, where we're going with this technology or where we could go. And we, you're right, we have a choice to make as people. Are we coming together and are we working together and are we solving problems as a species that lives on a planet? Or are we angry about our way or the highway based on our small understanding of our little county or our little town or our little city and don't see the global? I think that there's a couple of different minds that's competing there. I would hopefully uh, much like us to go towards Starfleet and not Hunger Games, but I can see both um, emerging already. Uh, and and 
being able to regulate your emotions and work and be able to have um, less stress and better mental health will enable people to or empower people to make tough decisions and to be courageous and stand up for things that uh, aren't right in terms of um, you know helping everyone right or or only helping the few. So I think that yeah. I think that's a great place to uh, kind of wrap here in terms of transformative technology. Can you talk about, as we uh, are kind of wrapping, a little bit about how people can get involved with learning about uh, your work and how to follow you? Great. Yeah. Our website is um, you know, www.transformativetech.org. And, um, you know, and for those of you who are listening, if there is a desire in you to build a solution uh, for something, if there's something in your practice or something that you see in the world um, that you know is in what Paul and I have talked about, and there's a desire for you, you have a desire to build, um, then you know come and join us. You know our community is. Um, you know, engineers and scientists and researchers and clinicians. And, you know, there are these good hearted people, you know, who are looking to build the tools. Um, and you, as I, you've heard on the show, um, you know, we have a very human centric approach. Um, and so if you have an idea and you want to talk to people about it, um, you know, and you might want to join a team, or if you are fully committed to your practice or fully committed to your lab, um, you know, you can advise startups, you can help companies from, you know, going in the wrong direction. Um, you know, like there's so many ways for you to fit in. Um, there's so many ways for you to contribute. And the reality is it's like, you know, we're not going to, we're none of the disciplines, like the problems are multidisciplinary, you know, kind of like, like, you know, Paul, you said about all these different pieces and how community amplifies the impact, positive impact of therapy. It's like, so the problems are multidisciplinary. And so the solutions must be multidisciplinary too. So if, if in your heart, you're an explorer, if in your heart, you're a builder, if in your heart, you want to, you know, create this new future, then come and hang out with us. You'll find the people who you know, also want to, and who knows, maybe you'll, you know, build the next thing that humanity really needs. I think that's a great invite, Nicole, and I really appreciate your time. And I really hope that our listeners will get involved. And if you don't know much about technology and you've just found this podcast, check out the website, transformativetech.org. So, and if you're into technology, obviously check it out as well. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Nicole. Thank you. Bye. And there you have it. This has been another episode of the Intentional Clinician Podcast with your host, Paul Kraus, licensed professional counselor. If you're enjoying this show, please share it with people you know. I would surely appreciate it. As promised, I'm going to share an introduction pitch for my online course for parents of young adults who are trying to navigate this uncertain climate. Once referred to as the failure to launch generation, today's young adults are facing unprecedented challenges, leaving many parents of young adults feeling fearful, confused, and agitated. Today's young adults face an unstable job market, the ever-increasing availability of drugs, alcohol, and sexual hookups, uncertain career prospects, high housing costs, and political and social upheaval. While many parents are anxious to help their young adults move out and begin their adult life, these same parents of young adults often feel frozen in terms of attempting to sort out what type of support is appropriate and how to navigate the emotional highs and lows of their child's experience. They often wonder how to change the communication patterns between them, as well as dealing with their own fears of what could happen. Hi, I'm Paul Kraus. I'm a licensed professional counselor, and I've been working with young adults and their parents since 2007. All of these reasons and more are why I developed an online course for the parents of young adults. Some of the topics covered within this course are what is an emergency and what do you do with it, 
understanding the stages of change and the rites of passage for young adults, learning about how to change communication patterns, setting up realistic boundaries, ways to promote pro-social activities and reduce antisocial behaviors, and what to do if your young adult is suffering from an addiction. If you'd like to learn more, just click the link below this video. And thank you for listening to that. If you are interested in this course and how to preview it or purchase it, the link will be in the show notes below. Until next time on the Intentional Clinician Podcast, I'm wishing you all a safe and peaceful week. If you are looking for an Emdria consultant, I am now an Emdria consultant and can provide the training for 15 of the 20 hours needed to become Emdria certified therapist. I am already starting two Emdria consultation groups, which are both taking place online right now. For details, check out counselingsupervisorgr.com or healthforlifegr.com or send me an email. If you are in need of counseling, do not hesitate to make an appointment with a local counselor in your area. You can also make an appointment with the excellent clinicians in the Grand Rapids area at Health for Life Grand Rapids and the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids by visiting the website www.healthforlifegr.com. That's health, the word for, the word life, and the letters gr.com. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and his guest, and while these are based upon the literature they have read and their experience in their respective fields, this should not be viewed as a definitive opinion on this or any other subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you are in a crisis, please dial 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. Are you a young person of color feeling down, stressed out, or overwhelmed? Well, then text Steve, S-T-E-V-E, to 741741. That's the name Steve to 741741, and a live, trained crisis counselor will respond. You can support your local bookstore by shopping at www.bookshop.org or bookshop.org. You can order online from the comfort of your own home while supporting local businesses and -and brick-and-mortar bookstores near you. If you are not already connected to a counseling organization in your state or area, please look into it. Here are two examples. The Michigan Mental Health Counselors Association and the Arizona Counselors Association are both excellent organizations that are working to keep mental health services available statewide, increasing education, promoting best practices, and helping keep licensed professional counselors and other mental health professionals accessible by the public. We are in a very difficult mental health crisis right now, and we need all hands on deck. In fact, we need counseling uh, experts to be brought into many other parts of our society, including schools, anything regarding public safety and police, Uh, obviously politics Um, and we need people that are able to help facilitate dialogue and nonviolent communication no matter what your level of expertise there is always something unique that you can contribute so try to get involved with a local organization or if you're already a professional see what you can do to merge disciplines where you are needed all right thanks so much for listening until next time